Williams and I are very pleased to be able to share this special moment with you and also in order to do this also to share the time with the University of Maryland. I first of all want to tell you that I was at a lunch some time ago in the UK, not so long ago, and I was given a story by this wealthy African man. And he said that there was this family that had a death and they could not find the doctor to write the death certificate. But one member of the family said that he had a friend who would write the death certificate. So they went after this doctor. And the doctor took the name of the patient, the age of the patient, and then he said now, he asked them a few questions. Did he smoke? They said, no doctor. Did he drink? They said, no doctor. They said, did he chase women? They said, no doctor. He says, well, I can't write the death certificate. They say, why is that? He said, the man never lived. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this afternoon, hopefully, uh, we can show that we have lived and done some good things. I think before I begin what I'm about to say about myself, and I must say that you all make me feel like a star, and I don't consider myself to be any star. I'm just a human being that God has placed on this earth and I think I've tried to do the best I can for mankind. Um, I just want to say a little bit about our sister island, Barbuda, and to say to you that Hurricane Irma devastated Barbuda because we, we had a storm with winds of the proportions we have never had before. And 90 to 95 percent of the buildings were totally destroyed. And we had to evacuate the entire island to Antigua and Barbuda. So you can imagine what that was. But I would say to you that the preparations for the hurricane by the government and all the agencies that were involved was the best I've ever seen anywhere in the world. I mean, for three days prior to the hurricane, they, were, they had programs on the television telling you what to look out for what the shelters were like, what to carry in the shelters, and they gave you examples. They told you what to do with your house. I mean, it, it, that, no, no stones were left on, on, on turned. And then we had the hurricane. And I must say the, the programs kicked in. In other words, we have a National Office of Disaster Services, and they were very good. The Red Cross came on board. And we have a Caribbean disaster services also, a group of people, and they came in and we moved all the people with help from neighboring islands. I think one of the first countries to offer help was Venezuela. They sent two planes and we were able to move those persons in a day from Barbuda to Antigua. And that meant we had to put shelters in and then we had to feed the people and we had to make sure that they were comfortable. And I'm happy to say today that I did visit the shelters myself and spoke to the Barbudans and they were very comfortable. Of course, the problem now lies with how we rebuild. How do we show resilience and rebuild Barbuda? The politicians have quite a challenge on their hands because the Barbudans want to return home tomorrow. <laughs> but there's no drinking water, there's no electricity, and there are no telephones. Even the telephone poles and so on were, were, bent, were, were broken up. And so there was no communication with Barbuda for quite a while. And so these are some of the challenges that we have. But I'm hoping be, that, that there will be some coordinating force or body put in place by government that will ensure that there's no duplication and that this thing is done well. So that when Barbuda has been rebuilt, it will show the resilience of our people and it can be a model for other countries recovering from such a natural disaster. Because Barbuda, as you, I don't know if you know, but it has the largest um, frigate bird sanctuary in the world. It has lots of caves. And also it is the best dark sky destination in the world. It has never been marketed as such, but I am going to certainly tell those persons who are doing the marketing to add that to the attraction of Barbuda. 
And I think if it is done well, that lots of people would want to go to Barbuda to experience these things. So I just wanted to give you a sort of update on what has happened with the situation in Barbuda. And I've just returned from the United Nations. And I must say to you that there are several nations in the world who are seeking to give assistance, not only to Barbuda, but as you know, to Angola, more recently Dominica, St. Martin, and um, Tortola. And I hear St. Croix as well. I was just reading really, that St. Croix had a, a big hit from, from the, the second hurricane. I called a friend, and, and, and a friend from St. Croix called me, and he was telling me how bad St. Thomas was hit. And he said, everybody from St. Thomas is coming over to St. Croix. But then I learned now that St. Croix now has been badly hit. So it's, it's quite a challenge for our people there. But I'm also pleased to see the outpouring of support coming not only from people locally, how the Antiguans have responded, but how Antiguans and other persons from overseas, here in the United States, in England, everybody, they're really banding together and trying to offer support, and I really appreciate that. But to say that today, I want to give you some ideas of how it was for me um, as I practice medicine as a doctor, then as a politician, and then as governor general. Antigua and Barbuda, like the rest of the world, is really going through a metamorphosis in medicine, in that we have, we have new drugs emerging all the time. We have new equipment, improving techniques, and we must adapt very quickly and safely to constantly upgrade and give our people the best possible care. That's what that is saying to us there. Now, what you see there is when I became a doctor, of course, I used to have these clinics in my father's constituency because he was a politician. And um, I felt that the best way I could help to serve the people of the area. At that time, I will tell you, I had no interest in politics and no intention of entering politics. But it's just that I had that sort of um, love for the people of our country, and so I, I did that. Now, basically, we have, those are people in emergency services, and they are the people who carry that out. When initially, Antigua had one ambulance, and it was very difficult for people to get around. People didn't have as many cars now. What has happened now is that everybody almost in Antigua has a car because they're able to bring cars in from overseas. <laughs> but um, this is a situation where we have the emergency service which helps us quite considerably here. There are three main problems facing us in Antigua this time. And one is epilepsy. The second is cancer. And the third is renal disease. And I am saying that because at the present time, we have had uh, a group of people, a Dr. Caitlin Huffman from the States, and there's Dr. Dave Clark, an Antiguan doctor, and Dr. Barbara Baker, and Dr. Joyce Lynn Walter Thomas, who have set a team up and they came to Antigua and they have been assisting us in terms of the program for epilepsy, where they have been educating the doctors, they have been diagnosing the case of epilepsy and providing the right type of treatment. And that is a useful exercise. Now, we will come later to cancer and renal disease. Uh, that, what we see there is my flag. That's the Governor General's flag for Antigua and Barbuda. And, of course, that's Her Majesty the Queen, who knighted me, as you heard, in 2014. And I serve as her representative in Antigua and Barbuda. And I would say that that is some of 
that is part of the, the situation when it comes to the countries in the Caribbean that have the Queen as head. As you know, some of our countries now have presidents, but we are still very much associated with the, with the Queen in Antigua and Barbuda. And what we see there is that first, I am, I've got, I'm going to attempt this afternoon to talk to you about my life, 70 years of life in about 40 minutes. And it's not so easy, but on the screen really is the president of Dominic and his wife and my lady Williams and myself. And now that is, when I became a physician, I vowed to do the best I could in order to take care of the people in Antigua and Barbuda. And this continues to be a joy for me, to help better the lives of others, caring for the community as a, do as a doctor and also as the head of state of Antigua and Barbuda. As I said, I graduated from the University of the West Indies in 1976. And I did my final year and my internship at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And that was quite an experience that in the background there is the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And then I came and I worked in 1978 at our Holberton Hospital for two years. And those were important times. What happened was that I knew when I got back to Antigua, we did not have the number of specialists in order to cope with the challenges. So I made sure that during my internship, I did all the specialties that I could. I did medicine, surgery, obstetrics, gynecology, ear, nose, and throat, pediatrics, <laughs> <laughs> the whole gamut. In order to be able to deal with the situation because I knew I would have to be my own consultant. I also recognized there, there was indeed also a shortage of doctors. And what we did, we brought in doctors from Korea and India. And that was not easy because these doctors did not always speak English so well. The Koreans had a great difficulty in speaking English, but the Indians spoke very fast. And you had to listen very carefully. And as you know, a good doctor makes his diagnosis from history alone. So it becomes very important to, to be able to, to deal with that situation. Um, while at the hospital, I also taught pediatrics for the nurses. I taught pediatric, um, pediatric nursing to them, pediatric medicine. And also, I also took care of the first lot of family nurse practitioners. Because of the shortage of doctors that we had in the Caribbean at the time, they decided to introduce this thing called the family nurse practitioners. Some doctors didn't like that idea too much, but I thought it was a good thing because what one was trying to do is to deliver quality care as best as one could. And if doctors had other persons who could see some of the patients before them and have the cases, some cases did not need referral to a doctor. And so the family nurse practitioner came in and did a great job in terms of helping to take care of that situation. And um, in addition to being a doctor, I also was the, the personal physician for then Prime Minister Sir Vier Cornwall, but on a pro bono basis. And um, I, I did that to the best of my ability because as you know, he was getting rather old at the time. And there is our father, Ernest Williams. Um, he was a politician for as long as I've known him, as long as I knew myself, because when I was born, he was in politics. And when he died, I was still in politics. <laughs> so he, between us, I think we have served our country for near 70 years, because he was there for over 40 years, and I did 20 years, and now three years as governor general has been quite some time. And um, the other thing was, and um, our mother, our mother was a teacher, so that um, one had to perform as best one could with the situation because, you know, your parents are always expecting something good of you. Um, when I decided to go out into practice, 
I had to decide what I was going to do. Now we had surgeons, we had internal medicine physicians, and I said, what could I do to make myself sort of indispensable? So I decided to embark on aviation medicine. And so I called the people up in Oklahoma, as you see there, and I, no, before I called Oklahoma, no, I, I went to England in the Royal Air Force and did, and did medicine, I did aeronautical medicine and got my certificate in medicine. And then I called Oklahoma because I understood to work for the FAA, you had to get permission from them. And so I called them up one day and I said to the gentleman, I've done the certificate course in England. He said, well, sir, that's their course in England. You have to come here and do our course. <laughs> so I turned into Oklahoma and did um, aviation medicine there and was a, a, an aviation medical examiner for them. And also I became an aviation medical examiner for Transport Canada. And then after about four years, they made me a senior international aviation medical examiner. And then I became a member of the American Airline Medical Directors Association, the Associate Fellow of the American Aerospace. I'm a, 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 a trustee of the Civil Aviation Medical Association. And um, now I sit on the board of the Civil Aviation Medical Association for some 11 years now. And also, I, um, I also do the same thing for Canada. I also acted as consultant for all the airlines flying in and out of Antigua, and I still do that today. I still keep myself very active in medicine. In point of fact, it was just um, it was just on Sunday that we came in from North Carolina, where I'd done gone and done a course and done an exam. Because as a senior international aviation medical examiner, you're required to do a refresher courses and do exams. Um, that sounds funny to some people, that, that's how it is. Now, the other thing I observed that there was, we did not have sports medicine physicians. And I used to go and watch the athletes practice. So one day, I said to the coach, uh, well, who takes care of our athletes here? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, when our athletes get injured, who takes care of that? And who ensures that the athletes, their blood indices are good? And who ensures that, um, that they have the right weight for their height and all that? He says, well, nobody does that. <laughs> so I said to him, well, what you can do is that you can send them to me, but don't send all at one time. <laughs> send, send me about five each time. And um, they did that. And then what I did, what happened was that they then organized a course for me in Colorado Springs at the US Olympic Training Center. And so I went there and did some aviation, some sports medicine. And then I also went to, went to, to Australia and did some sports medicine there as well. But during that time, of course, um, there was a problem where we had to go to the Los Angeles Olympics in 1984. And the then president of the NOC came and asked me to help them to raise some money, which we did, and the team went off. And then the people kept saying, well, you should be the president of the NOC. And I said, no, I don't want to remove the president. That's fine, I'll support the president. So they made me vice president. And then in 1996, they made me president of the NOC. But during that time, of course, I, I had been president of several associations, and I also became a member of the Royal Society of Medicine during that time, which was interesting. Um, that's okay, not this day. Now, this is one of our, our pediatric consultants, and she's talking to some nurses. Now, remember I told you that I did um, lecture to nurses, and um, our nurses certainly get a very good education, and they are in demand in the UK and the USA. So you'll find that many of our nurses go off to England sometimes and go off to the United States where they get jobs because the quality of medical care and their knowledge is, is, so is quite good. And that is a good thing. Now, lots of people in Antigua, they, they believe in their, their, their herbs. 
they push tea and they drink bush for all sorts of things. And they think that that is the panacea for most things. But then when that fails, then they have to come, they have to, come to the doctor to, to really get the real treatment in order to make the right diagnosis. When I returned to Antigua, it was a very shocking thing for me because I worked at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and we were using disposable syringes and needles. And when I came to Holberton, old Holberton, they were sterilizing syringes and needles and using them again. <laughs> and I thought that was some that, that was terrible. So what I did, I went to the Prime Minister then, the same Mr. Bird, and I said to him, you know, Prime Minister, we don't do that anymore. They have disposable syringes and needles. So he gave the orders to the Ministry of Health for them to order disposable syringes and needles. And so we were able to overcome that problem. In addition, you will find that, um, as I said, in terms of clinics, we, were, we didn't have that many clinics. So what the government did to, was to rent homes from people in the various villages. And so they divided the island into districts. And they assigned a doctor to a, to a district. And so the doctor used to go two to three times a week. And in that picture, you see me uh, attending to a baby. And that was, that was a very useful thing. Now, they have built better clinics around the country, and they're also seeking to ensure that we have primary health care units, maybe in three sections of the island, one in the south, one in the south, one in the north, and one in the east. Because what used to happen here was that a lot of people go to the ho went to the hospital for everything. In other words, if you have a dog bite, they go to the, to the emergency room at the hospital. If they get a nail dig, they go to the hospital. And when you have accidents, that causes a problem because then you have to divert all your resources to dealing with accidents, especially when it involves several persons. And so the idea of developing these uh, primary clinics is to take the load off of the emergency room and the hospital. And then so that these primary units can deal with things of that nature. I mean, now there's such a, there's such a high incidence of diabetes and hypertension and that people, and they are, they're almost afraid. They're, they're almost afraid to go to the doctor because a lot of people are afraid of taking medication. They're afraid of needles. They think one day they may have to take insulin and they don't like, they don't want to be stuck with needles every day. And so that, that poses a problem for our people in that, in that sense as well. And um, we are trying now to ensure that we can do more for the people. So here we have this ambulance and then we moved on to a situation where we built a new hospital. And having built that new hospital, we have very good emergency services. We have now, instead of one ambulance, we have seven ambulances, six to seven ambulances with emergency personnel who are always on call. And when you call an ambulance, I can tell you, no matter what part of Antigua you, uh, you reside, I would say within 20 minutes, 10, 15 to 20 minutes, you can have an ambulance at your doorstep even as far as Miller Reef Club. Because just the other day, I got Miller Reef was thinking that they wanted to buy an ambulance. And they asked me what was my view on the matter. I said, well, if you have, if you have money to, to, um, to put aside, then you can buy an ambulance, but there's no need. You call an ambulance, and in 15 to 20 minutes, that ambulance can get from St. John's to Miller Reef Club. And while I was talking with them, I called the ambulance service. And I said to the, the, man, the head man, I said, if I call you now to Mill Reef Club, how long would it take you to get here? He said, that between 15 and 20 minutes. And then I heard that. So they changed their mind. I said to them, what if you wanted, you could, you could possibly lease an ambulance, you could pay rent for an ambulance and keep it there. But I said, how often do you need an ambulance? I say, look at the season, from November to April, you may need an ambulance once or never. 
So you will train a lot of people, have them sitting there waiting for something that never happens. And if you need an ambulance, you can get one in 15 to 20 minutes and you have a nursing service there already. So there was no need to, um, to do that. So this is how it goes. And um, most medicine in Antigua and Barbuda is provided free of cost, as you see by public pharmacies and the medical benefit scheme. And the medical benefit scheme covers some 11 diseases, and you see some of them listed there. And um, once you have those diseases, you get your medicine free. But at the end of every month, of course, you pay to the medical benefit scheme, you pay your social security to take of you when you retire, and you pay your education levy. Um, you heard about the education levy before, and um, I may go a little bit into that after when we, when we get through here. And if you look here, you see the types of vaccinations and the, 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 the things that are taken care of. And I'm happy to tell you that we have eradicated measles from Antigua and Barbuda and within the country. And that is significant. And as we move along, very recently the government has done a lot. They have bought some new equipment. So the MRIs, ultrasounds, CAT scans, new laboratory equipment. They are all now present at our, our new hospital. And um, as you see the names of some persons who were involved in, in the program that we spoke about earlier. Now in addition to that, we have now a cancer center in Antigua and Barbuda. And that is to take care of the persons who develop cancer. And when we look at cancer, we, you, as we go along, I'm going to show you just exactly how the cancer has, has come along. We spoke earlier about um, people having prostate cancer. We spoke about that and we spoke about breast cancer. And what has happened, as you know, the treatment for these things can be very expensive. So what has happened here is that there has been a public-private partnership between government and the private sector where you can get um, radiotherapy right there in Antigua. And I must say that the effort has been a, a, a one that takes a little time because, first of all, we have to screen the men. And before, earlier, men were afraid to go to doctors. Now, because of the high incidence of prostate pathology, men are going to the clinics. When they, the unfortunate thing is that it is not as organized as we'd like it to be. We have times, maybe twice a year, there's a doctor, a urologist who is in Antigua, who teams up with the American University of Antigua, and they have like a little session, in a, like on a Saturday, and they may see 300, 400 men. But the problem is what happens after that? You want to be able to screen, then you want to determine who needs chemotherapy, who needs radiotherapy, and whatever therapy they need, and then one needs to be able to follow that through. And so therein lies the concern. Now, when you look at cancer here, when you compare Antigua and Barbuda with the Caribbean and the USA, the blue line is Antigua, the blue, the blue, the blue um, upswing there is Antigua, the red one, is the Caribbean and the green is the USA. You will see that as far as prostate cancer goes, Antigua is at the top there. And then you see the red, which is the Caribbean. So and the Antiguan average for prostate cancer is above the Caribbean average and way above the USA. And when you look at this one, as well, you will notice for breast cancer, you see where breast cancer is, the blue line again is Antigua, the red is the Caribbean, and the green is USA. And you see that Antigua, we have far more breast cancers in Antigua and Barbuda internally than we have either in the Caribbean or in the USA. And when you look, take a I think internally, 
You see there? Fifty-six percent of our cancers are prostate cancers. So what it means is that our men, the, 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 the mortality rate among our men will be higher for, for that cause. And if we can diagnose these things earlier and have early intervention, it means that we can do better with that. And when we look at the situate cancer, cause of cancer deaths in women, in Antigua and Barbados, breast cancer, 36% of all people die from that. And um, we, we spoke of the kidney diseases here, and we're saying the reason, the main reason for that is because we have a very high incidence of diabetes. And as you know, diabetes has these multiple complications. You get cataracts, it can affect your heart, it can affect your kidney, it will affect the nerves, it will affect the autonomic nervous system, and the like. And um, so it is very important. The problem is that no matter what program we have, we still have to get better at it. People are afraid to acknowledge that they have diabetes. They're afraid to acknowledge that you have cancer. And um, you know, even if they have things like hypertension, you will find that they don't take their medication on time. Or sometimes they, they forget the medication or they run out of medication. It's unbelievable. I had a patient the other day who said to me he was having a pain in his chest and he thought he wanted to go overseas to check this pain out. And I said to him, well, why don't you come and let me check you out before you go? When I checked his blood pressure, it was 170-110, and I treated him for it. It went down to 130-80, the pain disappeared. So about 10 days later, I said, let me call him and see how he's doing. And I called him, I said, well, how are you, my dear friend? He said, well, Dr. Payne, come back again. I said, have you been taking the medication? He said, no, because you tell me the pressure come down already. <laughs> So the thing is that he figured because he took the medication and the pressure come down, I said, I told you this is a lifelong thing and you're going to have to take medication for the rest of your life. And so he went back on the medication and the pain has gone and has not come back since. But it, a lot of it has to do with education. And this is really just showing you some of the new equipment that, that we have in Antigua and Barbuda. Now we have health service delivery and healthcare and what is happening is that the government is doing its best in terms of trying to ensure that everybody has access and we see the head of our Antigua and Barbuda Defense Force here having his blood pressure checked. In fact, what they have done, we have so many eye problems that the Chinese have come in with a team and, and with equipment and they did it something like 200 or more cataracts in Antigua. The Venezuelans came in and they did the same thing, which was a very good thing. And, um, and now we have a full-time ophthalmologist at Mount St. John's Hospital, which is good, helping to deal with the com eye complications. Now in Antigua, as we say, we have some 26 community health clinics and all the main health centers have pharmacies as attached to them. So people don't really have to go too far in order to get medical care and to get their medication. And that has been assisted by the medical benefit scheme, which really helps to ensure that we get the medication that we need and they buy the drugs as a unit. The, the OECS, all the governments get together and they purchase their drugs together so that we can get the, get the jobs at a cheaper rate. And that, that, that is working very well for us. Um, also, there is that private medical care that you can get. And here we, we have one of our local surgeons who has a medical facility, Dr. Joey John, and uh, his team there, and they do provide services as well, in addition to Mount St. John Hospital. Um, so these are some of the services available in our community health clinics, the immunization, the well-being clinics, and so on. You see it all there. 
and um, comes right down the diabetic and hypertensive things. Very important because it is so very, so very common in Antigua. In point of fact, I, I was saying to some folks today, I recall that just the other day we had an electrical problem in, in our house and um, my electrician comes in and I saw him you know, wetting his lips and um, he always says, I said, can I offer you some juice? He says, no, water, water. And I said, I think you may have diabetes, you know, let me just check your blood sugar. And his yeah. blood sugar was something like 462. <laughs> Incredible. And I gave him a good lecture. My wife said to me, did you see how his face changed after you spoke to him? And then he, he, he was to come back to me because I said to him, I want to follow you through. And I haven't seen him since. <laughs> so when I return, I'll, <laughs> I'll have to follow him up again. But he also is afraid <laughs> of having to take some people think they can't take medication all day. I say your life, the quality of your life depends on it. Especially if you have high blood ten hypertension and you don't take the medication and your blood pressure may and you're gonna get a stroke one day. And so people, you have to almost fight with them with these things and, and draw examples so that they can see, so that they, they, um, they, they follow what they should. Now this is Mount St. John Medical Center where we are there and here you see a situation where we visit uh, these centers from time to time, especially at Christmas. And um, we give gifts to the, the persons at um, the hospital. And um, yes, that's the Clearview Hospital or Psychiatric Hospital that we visit as well. And um, because we don't leave, we don't leave um, the stones unturned. This is the geriatric, the, the geriatric care that's provided at the Fines Institute. The institution we have the Fines where we take care of our, our young people and care for persons who are mentally and physically disabled. We have the call the Care Project, and as you can see here, there, there's Lady William the Dam one of the children from the CARE project. And um, the government is currently in the process of establishing a computerized health information system that, that will help us to better um, control things that we have in terms of ensuring that we have the necessary medicines and that we know when they're coming, when they're being depleted so we can get that sorted. Here you will see the new American University of Antigua that has some 1,200 students. They take in about for over 400, 420, 440 students a year. So this September, they will be taking in about 430 students, actually. And that has helped them. They help in terms of doing health fairs where they go into communities and they take blood pressures, they check for diabetes and so on. And, and, and they also help to improve the quality of care. This one is, is where, as Minister of Tourism, remember I said I was an MP as well, so move on from medicine to politics. And when I entered politics, I first was deputy speaker for two years, and then I was given the Ministry of Economic Development, Industry and Tourism, and we established a new office in Italy. And what you see there is some of that. And in terms of some of the projects that I completed when I was as an MP or Minister of Government, was the Antiguan Barbuda Hospitality Training Institute, where we now where we now train a lot of people in our tourism industry. Because tourism commands the main focus of our economy. And I'm saying if we're going to deliver quality service and have a good product, then we need to train our Antiguan people so that they can perform and perform at a good level and let the people who come to our country feel welcome and want to come back. And um, I'm happy to say that um, as a doctor and as a minister, when I meet people and they say, you have, I love your country, I say, what do you love about it? They tell you the people are friendly and we feel safe. And everybody says the same thing. I don't know where they get it from, but that's a common <laughs> thing. 
that people say all the time. And in terms of the dredging of the deep water harbor that was done, um, we established the consulate in Italy, you see there. But one of the most significant things I think I did as minister, now as minister of education, I traversed many ministries, was to introduce an education levy. And when we introduced that education levy, I'm telling you 10,000 people about demonstrated on the streets against paying the levy. And that was quite something. So people began to dislike me and dislike the government. They said, Dr. Williams, I don't have any children. Why should I be paying an education levy? I said, because you have nephews, you have nieces, you have cousins. And there are lots of people coming into Antigua. At that time, the economy of Antigua and Barbados was doing very well. And so people were coming in from Dominica, from St. Lucia, from Guyana, from Jamaica. And they brought their children with them. They come first, the mothers come first, and then they bring in their children. And if you give them a chance, they bring in the boyfriends too. <laughs> <laughs> and what that did was to put great stress on the education system and on the health system. And I heard mothers complaining that their children did not have the textbooks. Their children didn't have a chair to sit on when they went to school. And I realized as Minister of Education, I could not just sit back and do nothing. And so I decided that we had to do something or else Antiguans would become second class citizens in their own country. And so when we introduced this education levy, what it did, it gave free textbooks to all our children in the primary and secondary schools. It trained teachers. I think when I left education, we had the highest percentage of trained teachers, both at the primary level and at the secondary level. It also brought, bought all the materials you needed in our schools, and it provides 140 scholarships from the students who pass to a first degree. And I will tell you, every year since then, since this levy, the island scholar gets no less than 16 or 17 distinctions. Whereas before, in that same exam, Antiguans used to pass eight or nine subjects. Our people are passing, the island scholar gets 16 or 17 distinctions. In fact, year before last, our island scholar was the first in the entire Caribbean with 21 distinctions. And that is a direct result of the education levy. But nobody remember it was Dr. Williams who introduced that. <laughs> I always, I, I sometimes make reference to it. Uh, that was just when I was reunited by Her Majesty. Now, in, ter in terms of, <coughs> of my role as Governor General, following my retirement from political office, I then returned full time to do my medicine. And then um, the then Prime Minister and the now Prime Minister nominated me to be the Governor General and the Queen appointed, appointed me. And um, so the thing is, what is my role as Governor General? Part of it is ceremonial. And here it was, I think I just delivered the throne speech. And that's the picture of the legislature where, 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 the, where the speech was delivered from the throne. Again, as we say, part of it was ceremonial. Maybe that was, maybe, yeah, I think that was an independence, as you can see there. Um, the other one, of course, is to appoint diplomats on the advice of the Prime Minister, uh, as you see there. And also to appoint senior civil servants. That one is the chairman of the Public Service Commission. I see being, being given his uh, instruments of appointment there. And there's also a community de development component. In this capacity, um, we, when, we, when I became Governor General, there were six, 16 organizations of which we were patron. And um, in two and a half years, the number has grown to 30. And so what my wife did, which I was very glad for, she formed an umbrella organization called the HALO organization and they raise funds to assist these organizations. And there are two major events. One is um, a dinner and auction, which is held in some part of the world, not in Antigua. Last year it was held in the United States, this year it was held in England. And Prince Harry came, visited as well, and that was very good. That helped to lift the profile of the event. 
and it came out very well. And the year before that, we had it in the United States of America. In addition to that, we meet with these organizations. Um, let's say we meet with one of them every 10 days, or once every two weeks or so. And the reason for that is to see exactly what these organizations are doing, what their plans are, and to help to guide them on the right track and also to give funding. But you don't give funding in a vacuum. We will, when they tell us they're doing such and such a project, my wife will say, okay, we'll sponsor that for you. We'll do this, we'll do that for you. And that, that works very good. We also have, uh, so these are members of the HALO Foundation with, with, with the twins there. And um, again, Oh, yes. The other thing that, 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 that my wife does is to organize scholarships for young people. I remember one evening we, when we were in bed, she said to me, Babe, I think we should um, help the young people some more and get some scholarships. And she says, I think I can get some scholarships from my university. And you maybe can get some from the University of the West Indies. I didn't tell her this, but I thought she was a little crazy. <laughs> because just about then, the university asked me to become a patron to raise funds for them. <laughs> so I said, how, how could I go and ask these people for scholarships when they're saying that they're short on money and asking me to help them to raise funds? And interestingly enough, though, a lady came forward and offered a scholarship in my name to a deserving student in Antigua and Barbuda. And then my wife, the next day, my wife learned that somebody from St. Mary's University in Canada was in Antigua, so we quickly sent out an SOS and had her come to Government House. And we discussed with her getting some scholarships. And she also got someone to work with the HALO to assist with the funding. So they, this, the university gave a discount and the, this other company gave an Antigua a full scholarship. Everything was fully paid. Everything, including insurance. And then my wife said, you know, one scholarship is not enough. So we were in England, and we, w we had a meeting with the company, and then they decided to increase the scholarships from one to three. So now there are three Antiguans who um, got scholarships this year, and every year, three Antiguans get scholarships. In addition to that, the HALO does things, it assists people in terms of buying glasses, in um, doing all sorts of things, but it is a very good um, organization, and um, even now with the relief, the number of persons who have called us, who call her, not she, the thing is, she gets the calls, but I get the load. <laughs> look at her, look at her. <laughs> the thing is that when they say they want to do so and so, she says they can call so and so for me. But it does work because people they don't want to turn the government general down, so it's, it's reasonable for me to call. But it does give me a, a fair, fair deal of work myself. Now. Another function of mine is to advise, warn, and encourage the Prime Minister and his government. So in other words, if there is something that I think is going wrong, I will call the Prime Minister. But he, he comes to see me from time to time. And um, if something is going wrong, I'll certainly call him in and, and give him my views on it. If they're doing something right, for example, they did the home care business right. I called him, I said, I am very impressed with your leadership. I must commend you for what you're doing. And, um, and uh, so you, you encourage them. And um, so it's advise, warn, and encourage. And so we do that. Another function of the Governor General is to see people and welcome them into the centenarian category. And so everybody who reaches 100, and we have 16 centenarians in Antigua in a population of 80,000. I don't think that's bad at all. Yeah. We were going somewhere up to 22 the other day, but a few of them died. <laughs> um, when I became Governor General now, I noticed that we were giving bouquets to the women and bouquets to the men. <laughs> so the first time I was giving a bouquet to a man, I said, I couldn't believe it. I did it anyway. And I said to my ADC, ADC, never again. What are we giving the man a bouquet for? I said, we must give him a fruit basket. And um, so we gave women flowers, 
and then we gave them in a food basket and my wife said, now whatever you give here, after a time the flowers wither and die and you eat the fruit and they're gone. What do people have to show? And she said, I want to take you somewhere to see something. And she took me to a business place and now what we give them is a plaque. But, and that, that, that is so, so, so much nice, so much nicer. And um, so that's what we give to our centenarians now. That, that's, I find very good. They, they say that I keep my finger on the pulse. I mean, I, I go around and I play a little cricket with the youngsters as well as sometimes and show them I can still hit a ball. <laughs> yes. And of course, the thing is that one has to interact with people regardless of their gender, socioeconomic status, or regardless of the race. And that's just an example of that. And um, I found that to my practice that I had already, I practiced my, 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 my medicine but under the mantra that a person's health should not be dependent on their wealth. And so I, I've always lived by that, and I, I, I certainly seek to practice that and um, teach that to everybody I come into contact with. Now, there are two other things that I do that, that in addition to my duties, two additional areas of focus, and one is the Government House Restoration Project. And as that picture, as you see there, is, is our Government House, which is presently being restored. And I'm happy to tell you that um, Dr. Barbara Baker here, she has been a shaker and a mover in that regard, and her husband, Philip Logan, who is next to her, is an architect. And they have been working with us pro bono for the last two years. Presently we have this, the, if you go to Government House now, you see the walls, which the wall are restored, and it's very, very nice. That she also brought on another lady from England called uh, Alexandra de Valmarana, who is a restoration um, architect as well. And she, they have all done marvelously well and assisted us greatly in terms of bringing Government House to what it is today. We are now moving forward. I have a, a benefactor who has donated $2 million. And we are now seeking to get all the pieces together so that and because that benefactor has said to me, we're not starting until we have all the monies pledged. And he says, I'm going to go to my friends and help you to raise that money. And we've had other meetings with other persons to try and bring things together. So in, in the not too distant future, I'm hoping, and I think we, I'm sure it will happen, we'll have a newly restored government house in the center of St. John's, of which all of us will be proud. Um, in point of fact, um, where is that one? All right, I think I see two people in that picture that I see sitting at the back of this room. <laughs> and um, really, this is the Venice Biennale. Again, this was this was piloted by Dr. Barbara Baker. This lady. All right, and Lady Williams, all right, that's right, that's right. And um, so the Venice Biennale highlighted an Antiguan genius, Frank Walter. And what was interesting, his life and work was studied in depth by Dr. Paper. It was cataloged, and then it was interpreted, and so the, the, the Venice Biennale is the world's finest art and culture show. And the theme of this year's Venice Biennale was an artist creating his own universe. And so Frank Walter's life fitted in to that, like a peanut pod. And Antigua, for the first time, had the opportunity to be present at that Venice Biennale. And so I want to commend Dr. Pam, Dr. Pena, and all my wife and all those persons who, who assisted in ensuring that Antigua was able to, that's a, that was me giving my speech at the opening of that, of that same show. And that's the cover of the book for Frank Walter, 
It's a very large book. I don't know where she got the time from. I know she has the words. Because that book is big. The book is thick and it's heavy. <laughs> and, but I must commend her again for, for putting that book together. And that's in, that's in Venice. You know how it is when you have to get into the... Uh, that's not my favorite ride. <laughs> but um, we had to do that and um, that's part of that as well. And um, that is another situation. The, the, the part of, of another part of the Governor General's role is really to speak to people from time to time and um, talk, give, give advice from, and that's what we, what I do there. Uh, that's a situation where we had a bit, when Prince Harry was there recently, the Queen and her husband sent that gift for us, which, we, which was very, very nice. That's a part of our government house, in the inner part of the government house that we're looking to restore. And um, that's, that's um, very nice there. And um, in this picture, it, we see the, the Cuban ambassador and his wife um, at function sorry, at government house. And um, that, that was a lovely occasion. Now, th and this one is the landscaping. Now, Dr. Baker is a landscape architect. And when I told her we can't just do the walls and the building, she said, okay, I'll do your plan. And in some four weeks, she came back with the plan. She came back with a book, a big book, a bound book about the landscaping. And the, then I had, a, I had a, a, a biggish problem. There was another landscape architect, another landscaper, not architect, who said to me she needed 150,000 US to put the plants in the government house. So there was I wondered, where will I find this? But then when Dr. Baker came, Dr. Baker said, um, we will use all Antiguan plants so that when the visitors come, they can see uh, Antiguan plants and see what they are and what they're used for. And that really helped me. And then she linked up with the environment division to get that done, and that was very helpful. And um, that's Dr. Caitlin Hoffman, who, as I said, assisted us with the epilepsy. And um, yeah, that's it. Now, so the Government House Initiative has been coming along very well indeed. My dear wife, she works with the girl guys and the brownies and, and all of that, and that, that serves them well. And here is Prince Harry looking to plant some flowers, a plant tree, she does some tree planting in the more, but Victoria Gardens or Botanical Gardens in Antigua, which is, which is very nice. And this is Generation Y of the Halo. The Halo also has a youth group, and they, they assist in uh, carrying out activities where they can help the young people. And so I would say to you this afternoon that a great, a great writer once wrote, a meaningful life is not about being rich, popular, highly educated or perfect. It is about being real, humble, able to share yourself and touch the lives of others. It is only then you can truly say that you've had a full, happy, and contented life. And so, with those words, I want to say it has been a great pleasure talking to you this afternoon and sharing with you some of my life experiences as I sought to improve the lives of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Thank you very much.